Many weeks ago, we started a series of lessons from Paul's very personal letter to the church of Philippi. <clears throat> well, this is the last in that series of lessons. And it's very interesting in how Paul ends this letter. I simply call this sermon a life of contentment. A life of contentment. Because as Paul closes this letter, remember, he's in prison. This is one of his prison epistles. So he's chained and he's uh, serving there his time. And he writes to his dear friends in Philippi and he thanks them, first of all, for their generous support of his work. And then he reassures them that regardless of his problems, regardless of his afflictions, he's content. And so by looking at, at this idea of contentment in Paul's life, we can understand what it's all about. The first thing we notice, Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 is this. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. I rejoiced in the Lord. So the first thing to notice is his rejoicing, which is a word that means intense rejoicing, was in the Lord. And he was rejoicing, why? Because of their care for him. There's a lot of, of personal issues here in the last few verses. So Paul is so thankful that they have revived their care. The, the, the word here means blossomed again. I think it's the only place in the New Testament where it's used. Blossomed again. They had been very ardent supporters of his work in the past, but for whatever reason, it had stopped. But it wasn't their fault that it had stopped. Whatever had happened was not their fault. They were still concerned for him, but they had been hindered from helping him. But when the opportunity came, what did they do? They helped him again. And that's what's so important. These Christians really, really cared for Paul. Paul knew it. And that was one of the ways that Paul was able to be content was because he remembered daily, maybe hourly, how they cared for him. And you'll see this in the next few verses, really all the way through the end of this chapter. Paul, he's, he's able to go on and he's able to endure because he knows this church in Philippi. He knows they love him and care for him and are concerned for him and are helping him. And that was a source of strength. And it should be for us as well. When we know that people have our backs, when we know that there are people who are concerned for us, when we know that there are people we can depend upon, that's vital to be content in this life. I know it is for me to know that people have my back, that people are concerned for me, that people uh, are willing to help me. That makes life possible. It makes life possible. Paul says it's something, though, that he had to learn. Verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have, here's the word again, learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. His contentment is not based on having all of his desires met. Contentment is not the same thing as happiness. And it's not even close. Paul knows that. It's not the same thing. It was something that he had to learn or something that he discovered through a long, difficult process. He said, whatever the state is, whatever the circumstances, whatever the situation, whatever the conditions, Paul says, I have learned, I have discovered that I can still be content. Doesn't mean he's happy in those circumstances, but he says, I've learned to be content in them. He says, that was what was 
critical. And it's interesting, the word he uses for content that's translated content here actually literally means self-sufficient. But in the context, how was he sufficient? He was sufficient in Christ. So it was only because he was in Christ that he could be content. That's how his needs were met. That's how he could be content was because he was in Christ. If he wasn't in Christ, he couldn't be content. So he had learned to be independent of circumstances. He had not always known how to be content, though. It was something that took a lot of time. In other words, when he became a Christian, remember when he uh, met Christ on the road uh, to Damascus and then he was told to go into the city and, and he was taught and then he was baptized, he wasn't immediately the most contented person in the world. It was something he had to learn by use and by practice. He had learned to be content. And he says, I've learned whether I'm poor or rich, whether I'm abased or whether I prosper, he says, either way, I have learned to be content. In other words, Paul could adjust to all circumstances. From one to the other, he had learned the secret. He had learned the secret, and it's a secret that few people of our day know. <clears throat> people in the United States, this is one of the most prosperous times in the history of our country, but yet, if you look at polls, we're the most discontented that we've ever been. So just because of prosperity, prosperity doesn't translate into contentment. And that's what Paul was saying here. Whether I'm prosperous or whether I'm dirt poor, Paul says, I have learned to be content. Like I said, it was a long process. Remember, he tells the uh, Corinthian brethren about uh, about all the things he had went through. You know, he had been stoned and he had been thrown in prison and he had been shipwrecked and all of these things. He had been beaten. It was part of the process. Paul says, through that time, I discovered, I learned that contentment wasn't about circumstances. Contentment was about being in Christ. He says that's where contentment really was. Christian contentment is a mystery to people outside of Christ. They don't understand it. Well, how can you be content? You have the worst life imaginable. How can you possibly be content? Because I'm in Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Paul says, regardless of whether I'm in prison, remember, he's writing from prison. Paul says, that didn't matter. He says, I've discovered that even in prison... I can be content. And it's interesting that he says, it doesn't matter whether I'm rich or poor, I can be content because both can lead to trouble. Here are some verses we might need to memorize. Let's go back to Proverbs 30. Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> because this is exactly what Paul is saying. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> the writer says this, and these are great words of wisdom. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who's the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Paul says, being rich or poor, either one can lead me away from God. He says, maybe the safest place is in the middle. Neither poor nor rich. That's kind of what Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn a few pages over in your Bible. Notice what he says there. Near the close of his first letter to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says... Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's, certainly, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Same idea. 
If you have the necessities, that's all you need. Paul says, just let life's difficulties teach us how to be content. And it's because of Christ that we can endure. Notice verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think that verse has been taken out of context quite a bit. The idea is, I can endure all things. I can endure the worst of circumstances through Christ. I can bear up in the worst of circumstances and conditions in Christ. In other words, Paul's source of power and strength is Christ. That's how he's able to endure. So Paul says, regardless, I want you to be assured that I'm content. And now he says, I want to thank you for your generosity, verse 14. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And it's not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. The Philippians had done what was right when they assisted Paul financially. It was the right thing to do. And they were at one point the only church helping Paul. And they had done it, at least at times, out of poverty. But Paul didn't want it for his sake. He wanted it for their sake. Paul said, I can get by either way. But when you help me, he says, it adds to your spiritual account. And there's two things here I think that he's talking about. Number one, they would receive two blessings. The one when they gave initially to Paul because they were helping him with the work. And then they would be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Here's something you might want to write down. These are great words. Not original with me by any means. The only money we will see again is that which we give away. I love that. The only money we will see again is that which we give away. Remember, that's what Jesus said. Don't store up treasures on earth. Why? Because... Moth and rust uh, uh, destroy it and, and thieves can get in and steal it. But he says, rather, do what? Store it in heaven. Store it in heaven. Paul says, I'm content. He says, I just seek the gift. But I seek it for you. I don't seek it for me. And of course, this money was... For God. Notice what he says. Indeed, I have all and abound. See, Paul says, I have way more than I need. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. He repeats the fact, again, that he's content. He's filled to the brim after having received their sacrifice. And he calls the support that they gave him a sacrifice. And he calls it a sweet-smelling aroma. When we give, like we just did this morning, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. Acceptable to God. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It's like we're bringing what we have to the altar and it's going up to God as a sweet smelling aroma that's what Paul is saying so this money for his support to teach and to preach was not Paul's money he's saying it's God's money they weren't giving it to Paul they were giving it to God it was well pleasing and he says my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He closes by saying, He is God. Notice how personal that is. My God. And He is. He's my God. My Savior. My Father. 
would completely supply what they lacked. So they had supplied Paul's needs, so God was going to supply theirs. So whatever they needed to serve God, to carry out the work, God would supply. That's the marvelous idea. It says you're going to reap what you sow. If you sow a little bit, you'll reap a little bit. But if you sow a lot, you'll reap a lot. And he ends by saying, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Greet every saint. There were saints, Christians, in Caesar's household. No doubt because Paul had taught and preached to them. Might have been soldiers, might have been cooks, might have been whoever. But those of Caesar's household, many of them had become saints. So even though Paul was in prison and it wasn't the best of circumstances and conditions, he had still used that situation to teach others the gospel. And as a result, people had become Christians. Especially those who are of Caesar's household. What a wonderful way to end this lesson. Can you say, like Paul did, my God... Is Jesus your Savior? Have you repented and been baptized? Have you been faithful in walking in the light? Have you obeyed Him? True contentment is only found in Christ. You cannot find it in the world. And we see this all the time in our world. People will want something and they get it. They're satisfied for a short period of time, then it's gone. We see this in little kids with a toy or something. They'll play with it, and it's just wonderful for a while. And then they kind of get tired of it. You try to get it, give it back to them, there it goes. But we expect that from little ones. Adults shouldn't be like that. Contentment is not found in the world. A little more will not make you happy, will not make you content. That's what Paul wants us to learn. He says, whatever condition you're in, whether God is, you know, you're, you're blessed with a lot, you're blessed with little, or you're somewhere in the middle, be content wherever you are. This morning may be the time that you have decided to put Christ on in baptism. Or maybe you're in need of special prayers this morning. David has picked out a song to help us think about our condition. And if you're, there's a need in your heart to respond, we want you to do that now as we stand and sing.